Today's presentation is Computational Comparative Pharmacology, Designing Better Medicines for Animals. Our speaker today is, is Professor Ronette Gehring. She's a professor of veterinary pharmacotherapy and pharmacy at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Before coming to Utrecht, Ronette was previously an associate professor of clinical pharmacology at the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And it was at the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine where she directed the Midwest Regional Center of Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data, Data Bank. Her research interests include using computer-based modeling to integrate and explain PKPD data. Ronette, welcome to today's webinar. I'll now turn it over to her to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that, that I think uh, that I find extremely interesting, and I hope um, the listeners will too. So, um, veterinary and human medicine have a lot in common. We share the goal of treating and or preventing diseases in our patients, and if that isn't possible, alleviating associated pain, suffering, and discomfort to improve the patient's quality of life. And both professions depend on medicines pharmaceutical products as one of the key tools to achieve this goal. But a fundamental difference between veterinarians and human physicians is the species of our patients. Whereas human physicians treat only one species, Homo sapiens, veterinary patients range from reptiles to fish and birds, and even within a single species. Patients may range from a teacup-sized chihuahua to a Great Dane. And this means more than a tenfold difference in body weight. So, if there is one central theme for veterinary medicine, it's diversity and variability. Ask any veterinarian about extrapolating dosage regimens between species. And they'll tell you that a cat is not a small dog, a sheep is not a small cow, and even within a species, there can, be a big, there can be big pharmacokinetic differences between two individuals of similar size and body weight because of breed differences in body composition, drug transporter expression, and metabolic enzyme function and, and expression. For this reason, a lot of attention and resources have been focused in the field of veterinary pharmacology on comparative pharmacokinetic studies. To quote J. Desmond Baggett, one of the founding fathers of the discipline of veterinary pharmacology, species differences in the dosage regimen required for a particular drug can generally, but not always, be attributed to variation between species in pharmacokinetic behavior of drugs. The typical approach to studying comparative pharmacokinetics is to repeat a study in the different species in which a drug will be used clinically. As a result, we see publications describing the pharmacokinetics of a particular molecule, so for this example, I chose meloxicam, in a range of different species. So for example here, cattle, parrots, rats, and horses, and these are not the only species in which such publications have are, appear. But the approach is to generate experimental plasma concentration time data, collecting, collecting it, and then analyzing it using different approaches, such as non-compartmental analysis, compartmental analysis, and more recently, we've seen more publications using nonlinear mixed effects approach. And all of this is then done and implemented in commercially available software, like Phoenix when nonlinear um, or Phoenix NLME. And you can see that this is important. As you can see from these results that I extracted from those previous um, publications, uh, this, this study, it's very difficult to predict what the pharmacokinetics of one species will be based on the other. If we look here, the half-life of meloxicam is twice as long in cattle compared to the horse, despite these being two species of animal that have similar body weight and size. And then, the half-life is even longer in the African great parrot, which goes against the general principle of allometric scaling in which we say that, dose, uh, that, that 
in which we say when we extrapolate doses between species that smaller animals tend to have higher relative metabolisms and therefore higher clearances, which require that these that smaller species or smaller smaller animals require relatively more frequent dosing and higher doses. For meloxicam, this can to some extent be, be explained by the important contribution of metabolism that, uh, that metabolism makes to the clearance of this drug. And we know that species differences in the expression and function of metabolizing enzymes can really be extrapolated between species using a simple mathematical relationship such as allometric scaling by body weight. When we take into consideration that an anti-inflammatory drug like this is often administered long-term to control pain associated with a chronic condition like degenerative joint disease, um, we realize that it's important for us to know these differences so that we can avoid either overdosing and toxicity or underdosing and inefficacy. But experimental pharmacokinetic studies are expensive. Given the large number of species that are a potential veterinary patient, Couple that with fewer financial resources available in the veterinary field, and it seems like there should be a better, more efficient way to generate this knowledge and extrapolate between species. And this is where I think for physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling can play an increasingly important role in the future for the development of veterinary medicines and the safe and effective use of those that are already available. In this approach, we progress from relatively simple conceptual models that simplify the body into one or more theoretical compartments simply so that we can describe the patterns we observe in plasma drug concentration over time to more complex models in which the compartments represent actual anatomical structures linked by known physiological processes that drive the changes um, in drug concentration that we observe. This means that we progress from a paradigm of data description and pattern recognition to data prediction and verification, which is a more efficient approach in the long run, although it does require more work in the short term, because it becomes mechanistic and therefore more adaptable to different scenarios through variation of independent um, individual parameters that have direct links to the physiology. So, in contrast, let's look at the classical compartment, um, the classical compartmental approach to pharmacokinetic modeling. We select a model that best fits the experimental data. Models will typically have one or two or sometimes three compartments, depending on whether the plasma drug concentration time data declines in a mono, bi, or tri exponential manner. What this means mathematically is that we require an exponential equation with either one, two, or three terms to adequately describe the data. But those compartments are theoretical constructs and have no direct relation to any true anatomical structure in the body. In contrast, the compartments in a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model are directly representative of the different organs of the body and these are linked together by blood flows. Other important components of physiologically based pharmacokinetic models are the partition coefficients that represent a drug's affinity or tendency to accumulate in an organ and parameters representing the clearance or elimination processes. A PBPK model is much more complex than a classical compartmental model, but it is still a simplification of reality. PBPK models can vary in complexity, mostly by how much the different organs of the body are separated out into separate compartments and how much detail the we and in how much detail we describe the different physiological processes some physiologically based pharmacokinetic models like this one um, have specialized compartments like the egg because this is a pbpk model that we developed of an egg laying hen um, so that we could predict residues of veterinary medicines in the X. PBPK models can sometimes be quite simple. Like this simple PBPK model that combines all the organs of the body into just two compartments. 
one for richly perfused tissues and one for poorly perfused tissues. And in this way, the classical two compartment model on the left is translated into a mechanistic model so that we can predict how plasma and tissue drug concentrations will change over time. And now we physiologically explain how that bi-exponential decay that we observed in the plasma come up, comes about. It's because the drug has a high affinity for the poorly perfused tissues. And the poor, um, uh, and um, because it has a high, high, uh, high affinity for these poor, poorly perfused tissues, it takes longer to achieve equilibrium. But once equilibrium is reached, the volume of distribution has increased relative to what it was in the, in the initial phase of the curve, and that results in a higher volume of distribution and therefore a slope that's less steep, uh, um, a slope of decline that's less steep towards the end of the time concentration curve. Now you can see another advantage of this approach is that the model predicts what the concentrations will be in plasma, but also in the tissues and in this case we haven't split out the individual tissues but we can predict what the concentrations will be in the richly perfused tissues and the poorly perfused tissues because the volume of distribution is no longer a, a theoretical fitted parameter but a physiological parameter that is a fixed a priori based on the actual volumes of the organs that have been assigned to those two compartments but notice here something that however Although this is really a very simple physiological model, it requires almost double the number of parameters of the classical compartment, the compartmental model on the left. So four, four parameters for the classical model, seven parameters for the physiological model. In addition, um, because the, the time concentration curves are described in terms of uh, a set of differential equations um, and these need to be run simultaneously with the results of one feeding into another repeatedly over time. The typical software that gets used for these models needs to have pretty good simulation capabilities um, and that's why software such as R or custom, there are also custom softwares out there uh, created for research and for industry. Um, SimSip is also an example. Nevertheless, um, even in Phoenix, you could uh, create a simple minimalistic or hybrid mechanistic model um, by carefully thinking about the processes and why your time concentration curve looks as it does, and then uh, link the values of the different pharmacokinetic parameters to actual physiological processes. So if we look at interspecies differences in pharmacokinetics, there are many reasons why there are differences. Um, but if we start, for example, with the rate and the extent of drug absorption, so parameters of bioavailability and absorption rate, we see that it's not surprising that these processes are often vastly different between species. Because, they are different spe because different species are adapted to different diets, varying from complete carnivores, such as cats, to complete herbivores, like horse and sheep, and then omnivores, such as humans, dogs, and pigs, somewhere in between. There are differences in their gastrointestinal anatomy and function that, account, that can account for the differences in drug absorption rate and extent. But even within omnivores, there are differences like the gastrointestinal tra tra transit time. So if we, for example, compare dogs and humans, the gastrointestinal transit time is about 12 hours in dogs and approximately 24 hours in humans. And then we look at the small intestine, it's considerably shorter in dogs compared to humans. And this is just naming anatomical differences. Then we haven't even begun to look at differences in drug transporter expression and function or metabolic enzyme that could contribute to first pass effects. So it isn't surprising that oral bioavailability of a drug in one species is often a poor predictor of bioavailability in another, as we can see in this comparison between humans and dogs. 
This particular study looked at 43 different drugs that are not specifically named in this graph, but if I go and mention a, a few uh, or two specific examples, if we look at the oral bioavailability of gancyclovir, for example, it's 10 times lower in humans than in dogs, 9% in humans, 100% in dogs. And then if we look at the oral bioavailability of clonazepam, that is three times less in dogs than in humans. So 30% in dogs and 90% in humans. So we can't even make the generalization that bioavailability in one species is consistently lower than in, than in the other species. Can we predict these interspecies differences in oral absorption using a physiological approach? It's not easy because it requires cracking open that black box, which is the gastrointestinal system of different animal species. We need to know where a drug molecule is released, the rate of release and passage along the, the gastrointestinal tract, where that particular molecule is absorbed. And while such a model would be extremely powerful, a lot of research is still needed to fill in the gaps as to interspecies differences to make such a mechanistic model useful. The good news is that there is work going on to do this. Different research groups like this one at Iowa State University are working on projects to crack open some of the black boxes by understanding the barriers to oral drug absorption using in vitro cell culture models and translating these into physiologically based pharmacokinetic models for different species. And hopefully we will see more of these initiatives in the future on both sides of the Atlantic. There is still a lot of work to be done to build truly mechanistic pharmacokinetic models for molecules that we use in medicines in both human and veterinary medicine. Absorption is just one of the processes that influence how plasma and tissue drug concentrations change over, the time, over time. Another black box is drug transport, and then we have metabolism, both of which are sources of sometimes unexpected and large interspecies differences, and both of which can, good news, be studied using in vitro models. But what can we do in the meantime as we wait until this knowledge becomes available? To quote one of the most famous modelers of the previous century, albeit a physicist and not a pharmacologist, models should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And what I interpret this as meaning is that a model, and specifically a pharmacological model in our case, should always be developed with a specific purpose in mind and needs to capture the essential elements that are important for that purpose. So if we go back to the simple compartmental model we show, I showed at the beginning, or an even simpler model consisting of just one compartment with two parameters, clearance and volume of distribution, we always have the opportunity to look at it from a physiological point of view. If I'm studying a hydrophilic molecule that is administered intravenously and of which the distribution is limited to extracellular fluid without any special affinity for slowly perfused tissues and clearance is limited to renal excretion by glomerular filtration without any reabsorption, a lot of assumptions, then this model represents all the physiological processes involved adequately enough, I would argue. We can set the value of clearance a priori, and that's, that's different to compartmental modeling. Uh, the values of parameters are set a priori based on physiological processes. So we can set the value of clearance a priori to a value that reflects glomerular filtration rate for a particular species. And then we don't have any need to incorporate any parameters for drug transport and metabolism. And then we can look at, physiologically, interspecies differences in extracellular fluid volume to predict differences in peak plasma concentrations and half-life. As a result, for example, here we can predict that the peak concentration of our hypothetical drug will be slightly higher and the half-life will be slightly shorter in, do uh, in dogs and cats compared to humans. And notice that this is not because of a difference in weight, because dogs and cats, there are certain dogs that weigh um, approximately the same as cats. It's a species difference. And um, 
So the half-life is slightly shorter in dogs and cats compared to humans. Um, once we've corrected, and then we need to correct for species differences in glomerular filtration rate, although that is relatively similar across species and can be allometrically scaled usually. So depending on the mechanism of action and the safety profile of the drug, this could have important consequences for a particular drug and might require dosage adjustment that would be um, different than simply normalizing to body weight. The difference between this approach and the classical compartmental pharmacokinetic modeling is that we are predicting the pharmacokinetics in one species based on another and our knowledge, understanding, and assumptions of the properties of the drug. And they remain assumptions, but we state them ahead of time um, and they are transparent and we state that we are making these predictions on those assumptions. And then how those properties of the drug interact with the anatomy and physiology of the animal. What we can then do is take these predictions and corroborate them or with data that we may have access to from different sources. That could be the literature, could also be sparse data from clinical monitoring or opportunistic data that can be collected without conducting specific expensive studies specifically to study the pharmacokinetics of that molecule in, in a particular species. So, and then the other, the other way of thinking when we're thinking physiologically is that we then generate a hypothesis. And that is also the value of these models. So we, we can generate the hypothesis that the volume of distribution of small hydrophilic molecules that are not metabolized um, is typically about a third higher in humans compared to dogs and cats. I challenge you to go out and look in the literature and informally test this hypothesis. Of course, not all physiologically based pharmacokinetic models can be this simple and still be useful, particularly if we want to predict concentrations in specific tissues or fluids such as milk, more complex models are required and we need the corresponding data, which cannot be obtained in food producing animals at slaughter, for example, so that we can validate them. So for example, if you want to predict milk residues, you need to add an other compartment. And that compartment needs to incorporate parameters that simulate the process of milk production. In addition, an other compartment by adding that, you open up the possibility to look at other routes and alternative routes of administration, some of which are specific to veterinary medicine, such as intramammary route in this case. So to summarize, um, I'm, I argue that shifting from a descriptive to a mechanistic and predictive paradigm in studying comparative pharmacokinetics has advantages for extrapolating dosage regimens and predicting treatment outcomes across different species. But we need better understanding of the processes that actually drive the pharmacokinetics of a drug and how these differ between species. A computational approach serves as a framework to formalize and systematically analyze these differences so that our predictions get better over time. And in a true learn-confirm cycle, that builds the knowledge base in an iterative manner. The models don't have to be extremely complex to be mechanistic, depending on the compound and your goals. Mechanistic modeling takes a lot of effort and time sometimes, but the reward is that we extract more meaning from available data so that future research can be guided to get optimal results. And this is particularly important in veterinary medicine where we need to do more with less compared to our colleagues on the human medical side. And with that, I'd like to thank you and um, welcome any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ronette. We'd like to encourage our audience now to submit your questions for Professor Gehring in the Q&A box and we'll take as many as we can. So, looks like our first question. In PBPK models, the compartments represent actual tissues. Does that mean you can use these models to predict drug concentrations at the site of action? 
That's a very good question. Um, and yes, uh, that is what we what we hope we can do because our compartments uh, represent actual tissues. Um, but you need to think even more mechanistically than that because you need to think where is that target? Where is that receptor? So. For example, if the receptor is um, on, on the cell surface and uh, the drug in the unbound drug in the extracellular fluid is what binds to the receptor, then that could be a fairly um, easy or, or that could be a fairly plausible uh, prediction that you can make is that that, that is the actual concentration at the biophase. Um, when you start thinking of uh, targets intracellularly, then it becomes more difficult uh, because uh, remembering that, um, you know, not, and it depends on the complexity of the model as well. So splitting out the individual compartments, uh, the individual tissues as compartments is one step, but then how much do you mechanistically break down that compartment uh, or those individual tissues as well? So if you truly want to be predicting concentrations at the site of action, um, you need to incorporate that as a goal of your modeling and then think about how complex you need to make your model. Someone wants to know, um, can you please comment on the role of free and total drug concentration on model creation? Sorry, um, of what concentration on model creation? Uh, they're asking about free and total. So I guess I guess commenting on, um, you know, is any drug bound by plasma protein? Okay, so free and total drug concentration. Yeah, and and that that goes um, w with my previous answer as well. Yes, um, it's it's very important because um, depending on your goal, but if your goal is to actually know what is the availability of of the drug at the biophase, we know that only free drug is free to bind to the receptor. And then you may, if that is your goal, then it becomes important that you um, incorporate plasma protein binding or binding to other proteins in the body, in tissue compartments, um, and, and understanding the kinetics of that as well uh, within, within the model. So. Um, yeah, uh, because it's mechanistic, you can start thinking of all the different processes and thinking how mechanistic it, you can get. Uh, the challenge is to to know <laughs> what that you you know to to how to become mechanistic to to have the data to be able to be that mechanistic. Someone uh, wants to know. What type of data is available in the literature with regard to tissue, comp tissue composition, for example, intracellular lipids, proteins, et cetera, specifically for cattle or not other not so commonly modeled uh, species that are modeled by PDPK models? There is information out there. Um, and. Um, that there are publications, for instance, by Malcolm Rowland that are where this is listed. But it's a good point that that is mostly from uh, for the the reason for for putting that or, or collecting that data is for the development of drugs for humans. So it will be for different species, sometimes dogs as well, um, but often species that are used in drug development for humans. So for cattle. I think that we, I and and I am not um, I haven't looked at that specifically, but those would be probably gaps in our knowledge. Great. Right. Looks like we have uh, one more question. Do you think that all PK models should be PBPK models, or are there still a role for other approaches to pharmacokinetic modeling? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that there's still a role for other pharmacokinetic modeling, and it, it goes back to that statement of, you know, you model you, you have you model for a specific purpose, 
Um, and something to remember is that the more physiological and mechanistic you get, um, the more uncertainty or, or the, the more complex your model becomes and um, the more uncertainty to a certain extent you build into your model because each parameter becomes um, a, a source of potential variability in your model. So um, <clears throat> uh, it, depending on your goal, but w um, for example, if, if you're doing a bioequivalence uh, comparison between two formulations, uh, then non-compartmental analysis is perfectly fine um, and, and you're describing the data, you're describing what you see um, and you're comparing it and, and that's your goal. And if you were to use a very mechanistic, physiologically based approach to that, um, you, you're going to have so much uncertainty or you're going to increase the uncertainty to, to an extent that you're not going to, um, you know, th th that your variability is going to increase in your predictions to the extent that uh, you might not be able to uh, demonstrate what you're wanting to demonstrate. That said, if you want to understand why, for example, two formulations are different, then a physiological approach uh, can help you. And um, the non-compartmental approach is not necessarily going to help you because you're just going to be describing what you see. So, so it comes down to, to your goal. Um, but I, I do argue that, that we should always be stopping and thinking physiologically about why we're seeing what we're seeing. Looks like we've got a, another question. Um, someone says, you have, a, you have a slide where you compare the, the GI tracts of humans, dogs, cattle, various animals. What is the most common route of administration to, of drugs to veterinary species, such as cattle or other exotic species? Um, so, so, yeah, it depends on the species, uh, is exactly. So, so there's no um, one answer for, uh, for each species. Uh, for, for dogs and cats, it's, it's oral because it's, it's easier and it's less invasive and um, you know mostly we can give these drugs quite easily to our dogs and cats. Uh, other species are really difficult to to handle and to coax to say okay you need to uh, take this tablet so then injectables become more uh, more common uh, and then there's some very species specific routes of administration like uh, porons and top spots for antiparasitics um, intramammary administration. So, so it varies by drug and by species, what you're treating. Um, yeah, but, but mostly, uh, you know, most of the formulations and uh, routes of administration that we use in humans, we'll also use in, in animals, particularly our companion animals and then other species, they, they can, there are different species differences. <clears throat> 